Okay, just need the slides. Good, there we go. Right, so I'm going to talk a bit about some architectural patterns, talk about microservices and uh, wh why they're interesting in enterprise environment. But first of all, I'm going to try and explain what it is I do. So I have this strange job where I work for a VC firm, but I'm not a regular uh, VC guy. What, you know, obviously, I do due diligence on deals, but I'm also providing a lot of technical advice to portfolio companies, sort of act as a consultant to the CTO. I network with interesting people. That's all you guys today, all of you, guys and girls, everybody. Um, so I'm interested to you know, catch up later if, you're in, if you want to talk about interesting technologies. So that part of my job is to build a very deep network of people that are interesting and are uh, playing around with interesting things. I also tinker with some technologies myself. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, I'm on the program committee for conferences. I present at companies and at uh, public events. So, and I've got a you know, relationship with cloud, various cloud vendors to so sort of uh, do things there. Um, so why am I here? This is kind of the enterprise adoption curve. You see enterprises ignoring technologies uh, until they can't ignore them anymore and they say, I said no, damn it, and then they basically get run over by the end users. Um, Netflix was an early adopter, so in 2009 we were started adopting cloud. The rest of the world started doing it and then a bit later enterprises started doing it too. So I was um, doing that with Netflix, but what I'm doing now is that this, uh, for the last year or so, I've been working at this intersection, somebody call it the digital transformation, but it's also this point where lots of enterprises right now are re-engineering, they're adopting cloud, they're adopting DevOps, they're rethinking the way they build products. Uh, it's the software eats, is eating the world, developer-driven infrastructure, there's all kinds of phrases around it, but it's been happening, and it's typically the early adopter enterprises were getting into this at the beginning of last year. It's now moving, I think, into the late adopter space, and over the next few years, you'll start to see pretty much everybody doing this. Maybe that 40% that dies will be the ones that never get there. Um, and the other thing, just as an example, at the beginning of last year, Docker wasn't on anybody's roadmap. And at the, um, at the end, by the end of the year, it was on everybody's roadmap. Everyone had a product. Everyone had a, had, had a strategy. It became a universal thing. So that is a, a very, very rapid transformation that's really unprecedented in this space. So that's been a, an interesting uh, time to be playing around. So I'm going to talk a bit about speeding up development, why microservice architectures are interesting for that, and a few things, words about where things are going next. But really, last year was the year where enterprises really started getting into cloud and DevOps. And um, Lydia Leong, the Gartner analyst, basically summarized that towards the end of last year, last October, that uh, people were comfortably using cloud. At the DevOps Enterprise Summit, this was my favorite sort of summary of it. Uh, Nordstrom went from optimizing from IT cost to optimizing for delivery speed. And then, just if you, if you haven't seen that and you want to get inspired, go look at the videos. You know, Gene Kim's down here, it's, you know, really put it together. We, the DevOps Enterprise Summit video streams on YouTube are just some of the best resources you can find if you're trying to find an example that makes sense for you as an enterprise to try to get through this transformation. And, um, Steve Brody from uh, Forrester said this may be the very best concert conference I've ever been to. It was, it was a very special event. We're running it again this, uh, this October. Okay, so what's the key goal of the CIO in, in a lot of companies? You know, they have a whole bunch of things they worry about, but a lot of what they talk about now is trying to align IT with the business. That's, that's a very key piece of, of what they're trying to struggle with. Um, but I would like to point out that Netflix doesn't actually have a CIO. Um, and it, one of the reasons is that product-related IT is completely embedded in the business. So there's no, reason, there's no sense that Netflix's IT division needs to align with the business division. It's one division. They all work in, on, on it together. And the engineering reports into product, and it's just one thing. So that's a different way of looking at things that kind of gets around that whole problem. There's a few directors of IT for making sure that there's Wi-Fi in the buildings and things like that. But that's basically the, the, the level of corporate IT at Netflix. It's, most, it's basically employee facing rather than customer facing. So how do you do that? So first of all is you've got to have a map. You have to know where you are and where you're going. And uh, if you haven't looked at this mapping process, as Simon Wardley's been uh, talking about this for a while, 
So you do a value chain map, and then you map, the, you know, that's the uh, vertical part on this, and then you map out how evolved are the different things in that value chain. The things on the left are very agile, the things on the right are very uh, off the shelf and, and utilities, right? So if you can plug two vendors together without even thinking about it, that's a utility, right? That's like I take a plug and a socket, and I don't need to buy the plug and the socket from the same vendor, but that's a utility standardized connection, you know, electricity or ethernet or something like that. I don't have to go buy Cisco ethernet cables to plug Cisco switches into Cisco switches and buy adapter cables to plug into somebody else's switch, right? That's a standardized thing. So the right-hand side of this is very utility commoditized things and we're getting infrastructure is in increasingly going there. So your unique product, the thing that you're trying to build that makes whatever you're doing different and new, that's the piece you need agile techniques. In the middle, you've got best of breed as a service. You're still, it's still evolving, but you're basically, you don't have to do it yourself. There's a lot of SaaS-based services that you combine together to put together parts of your business. Like there's no reason to build a system for notifying uh, you know, people that something's broken, there's a company called PagerDuty that does that. And there are a few companies that do it. Just pick one, you use them, you're done. You don't have to go implement that yourself by, you know, coding things up. And on the right-hand side, this is undifferentiated utility supplies. We care about some quality standards and cost, but you're not trying to innovate. You're not trying to invent new voltages to run the electricity in your wall out. So let's look at product development processes. And one of the assumptions you've got that we're working with here is that process prevents problems. Like if you ever had a, a release break, then you go, well, there was a stupid problem in that, so we'll have a process that prevents that stupid problem from happening again, and we'll lay out all of these processes. But what happens then is you build up these really complex sort of scar tissue processes where there are so many checks and balances that you can't actually get anything done. And that sounds like most large enterprises. Um, it's very difficult to not get there. It also sounds like most countries, most laws, most HR manuals, right? Anytime there's a set of rules, it will grow until there are more rules than any one person can understand, and then you get, I don't even know whether I'm in compliance anymore because I can't keep this set of rules in my head, and the rules aren't actually necessarily coherent, and they can be contradictory, and then you have to go. It just turns into a huge mess. So it's very difficult to rip those rules out and instead of building a, a, a set of processes that lock you in, what you actually do is you build a system and you have to have people that can have the right judgment to operate within that system. And that's, that's a difficult thing to get to, but that's the cultural, part of the cultural transformation and one of the reasons why uh, some companies are able to go so much faster than everyone else and without, do it without breaking. So what does it look like? What you're really trying to do is get your t get continuously deliver products, continuously deliver particularly software products. And you're trying to do it with this observe, orient, decide, act model. Now the OODA loop, as it's called, came from the Korean War. It came from dogfighting. And they sent out people in aircraft, and the ones that came back were the ones that had got this figured out, and the ones that didn't come back and ended up you know, getting shot down were the ones that didn't. So this is part of a survival process. It's not that you have to be going around it at a certain speed. You know, if you're just because you're doing agile and you're getting stuff done every two weeks, that could be good or that could be bad. If everyone else in your industry is on a one-year release, you're great. Yeah, if everyone else in your industry on, is on a daily release cycle, you're probably screwed. That's basically the thing. The OODA loop is about being more agile than whoever you're trying to compete with. Because every time you get around this loop, you learn something. You learn about your customer, you learn about your product, you learn about the market, you learn about technologies you're trying to use. You can play with technologies in this space. So the faster you go, the more you learn. And that's the basis of comp competitive um, of competition in this space. So that's why this is the alignment with the business bit. The businesses need to run fast to survive. IT needs to go faster to support them. So what that looks like is the observe part. You're trying to f understand you know, what you should be doing, what land grab opportunity is there, what customer pain point you're trying to deal with. That's really the innovation part. Some companies say they don't know how to innovate. It means they don't know what to do next. No one's even got a clue what they should be doing. So innovation is about getting these ideas out. The next thing is analysis and modeling hypotheses. And a lot of the time nowadays, that's unstructured hypotheses, things, questions that have never been asked before that have to be answered. So getting that done is really, a lot of that comes down to what's being called big data net right now. 
then you've got to just plan what you're going to do, get it done, share the plans, and the culture needs to get out of your way. If you have to have approvals all the way up to VP level to do the smallest thing, you can't possibly go fast. So this is about giving responsibility to the right level so that people can do small things quickly. And what we're talking about here is typically an incremental feature and doing things extremely quickly and a lot of the cloud-based automation. So this is API-driven deployment. Everything is automated. You check in code and it magically ends up in production without any human intervention. And that's, that is being run by a number of companies, but it's, you know, it's not normal in, in the enterprise space, but it's kind of the, the way you can get to. And what you typically find is you, you, then you measure customers and go around the loop again. What, did they like that A-B test? You know, you're doing an A-B-C-D-E variant. Okay, B was the one that they liked, and it turns out D is horrifically bad. Um, when you're trying out ideas on customers, it turns out there's, it's about three-way split. A third of all of the ideas that you have will work. A third of them make no difference at all, and a third of them make it worse. You don't know which third's which, and your intuition is always wrong, and you have to measure it. And this is the basis of, of iterative product development and hypothesis-driven development. If you don't measure in advance on small test groups what's actually going to work or not work, you end up think, thinking you are making it better, and at best you're, you're, you're blending in a lot of bad things with the good things. So this is one of the reasons, you know, if you watch Netflix, or even with a fairly bad internet connection, is a remarkably good picture. Right? I, I, yeah, I'm always amazed. I mean, I used to work at Netflix, but every time I watch Netflix on my TV, I'm amazed how good, how good the picture quality is, because every other streaming I ser service I have has a crappy picture and is stalling and, and, is, and is going, and, you know. It's, there's an incredible amount of hypothesis testing and tuning that's gone into making that picture look good. And, it, and it's, that detail is what, what the company, that's what makes you competitive in the modern world. And this isn't just, you don't just go around this loop in one direction. You bounce back and forth, you try things out. It's really about that agility. So how do you do continuous delivery if you've got lots of silos? Well, if your organization looks like this, um, getting something out requires that you have to have meeting, 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 file a bunch of tickets, do some more meetings, file some more tickets, right? That takes a while. Um, you can't do that 10 times a day because you can't have that many meetings, and meetings take too long to schedule. So this is obviously not happening in these organizations. So one way of doing it is you say, well, this team here has to go fast. We'll put them in a different building. They can ignore all our normal processes. Just have them go and do stuff. And when, after you've done that a couple of times, you realize that they're generating randomly different things, and there's no coordination across them. There's a lot of commonalities here. So the best way of doing that is to do this split, where the bits that you would previously call um, operations, if you like, are part of a platform team that is API driven. And the job of that team is to develop and support that platform. And that means you're basically becoming a, like a cloud service provider. I don't care whether you're in-house or whether you're using a public cloud or whether you're using something in between. The point is that it's API driven and the other teams are calling into it just to consume services. And then each product team is using microservices and they're using the same platform. So you've got some commonality. You can build this multiple layers of platform commonality. Now this is also the organization. So instead of having your org be vertical in this graph, it's horizontal. So instead of having a team of DBAs and a team of network admins, you have a product team that owns a particular piece of service. And if that product team needs a network admin and a DBA in it, they're in it. And they deal with whatever they need to do to run that team. Right? It's the things that are very common you put into the, pro the, the platform team. There's a bit more commonality. But then they're, they're, being, they're consuming they're being consumed in some sort of undifferentiated manner. They're just getting API calls and they're making sure if you need a new machine or you need a new network set up, that it just comes in as a regular API call. So this basically means that this is kind of the DevOps thing as a reorg. And a lot of times, if you know, look at companies adopting DevOps, one of the anti-patterns is we take what used to be the QA group and we rename as the DevOps group and make them feel better. Um, 
because now they've got it on their resume and they're DevOps people. Maybe you buy a tool, you get buy a copy of Chef or something and you declare yourself done. That's not really it. What you need to do, what, until you've done something like this reorg, you haven't really made the change. And it's difficult. It takes six to nine months for most companies to do a reorg, from like deciding that you need to do it to actually implementing it and all of the, all of the organizational hassle it takes. It's not a simple process. But if you go back to that DevOps Enterprise Summit again, you'll see companies, co company after company talking about, and this is where we finally realized this is the reorg, this is what the old org chart looked like, this is the new org chart, this is what we did. So it, it does work. And it's the people that don't go through this reorg that are the people that are at risk of going out of business. So this is what a typical monolithic service looks like. You have a plan, um, you have a bunch of developers, they develop their thing, you have some QA engineers integrating the work of these developers, and you have ops putting into production. This is a perfectly reasonable thing if you have, say, five developers. Now, the problem comes if you have 100 developers working on the same monolith. They just keep stomping on each other's code, breaking things. It gets harder and harder and harder to get this monolith released. So your release cycles get slower and slower, and then they get even more buggy. And you can actually get a runaway effect where it actually becomes almost impossible to get anything out. And I've seen companies get stuck into that, in, in that problem. So the problem is that a bug will block the, the a bug will discovered in QA will block the work of all the developers because that release doesn't happen. And a bug found in operations will block the work of all those developers. So as this gets bigger and bigger, every time you delay, you're delaying work that somebody has done and completed from reaching a customer. So the alternative is to break this into chunks. You have multiple release plans that are independent, they're going on their own schedule, they're, at, they're on their own time base, they're, 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 they're talking to each other and they're maybe calling APIs back and forth, but they are working most of the time, most of the things you want to do do not involve somebody in another team. And that also frees you up to use new technology. So now instead of writing everything in PHP, you can throw Node, Python, Java, Go, whatever. You can start experimenting with technologies on each, each team at a time. and then. You need a way to gather all of these random technologies into a common delivery platform. And what Netflix did when it was running on AWS was use the Amazon machine image as its container. And basically most of the stuff was Java, so it was a Java Tomcat container, but really the AMI was the container. And the system knew how to deliver AMIs to production, and they didn't really care whether you wrote Perl code in it, or Java code, or you know Haskell, or whatever. right? And there's all these weird things you could put in there, but as long as it's an AMI and it conforms to some standard patterns, you could get it into production. Nowadays, Docker is really starting to take that place because it's a standardized container that gives you a way for, to summarize what you built and throw it into production. Now when you get a bug, you just replace that one piece. You didn't block anyone else. And this is the real value of it. As the teams get bigger, it just gets harder and harder to maintain a microservice. So if you set it up correctly, you end up building an, an environment where everybody can iterate and go forward. Now there's a, an optimization on top of this, another thing that gets easier, because there's a lot of standardization here. So if we look at, let's say everyone wants to have a web server, well you just get an Nginx container from Docker Hub and you're done, or you want a Redis container, and you're using the standard builds to run Node or Python or Go, which is a standard curated thing where somebody else has actually put in the work to make sure that it's, it's, it's been debugged and it's not got any security patches, you know, holes in it, things like that. So you're starting to see standardized curated containers that are used across multiple, um, you know, used by thousands of people. Thousands of people are deploying the same container. You just add your config file on top and you're done, right? So what we're getting now is it's even less friction to get stuff done. Now this does, there is work being done. This isn't all in place right now. There's work being done to get better and better at having a proper supply chain, um, you know, understand what the supply chain is behind any one container. But this is where it's going. You'll see this really starting to happen in the second half of this year. And of course the, the deployment basically looks the same. Now what this comes down to is that there's, there's a change that's happening which we call run what you wrote. Or, or Werner Vogels in 2006 said, you built it, you run it. And that's the way Amazon's been running for, for t almost 10 years, right? So what that means is the developers have a bunch of microservices that they built, they own it, they're the only people that really know its current state in production, they're the people who are going to be on call if it breaks. So you do have 
some monitoring tools that are tracking what's going on, but those monitoring tools, if they see that a microservice broke, they will call a developer through something like PagerDuty, so that developer's the one that gets woken up at 3 a.m. And this is, turns out, when you do that, developers get really good at writing code that does not break at 3 a.m. They actually get amazingly good at it, and they end up um, with systems that are much more robust. And the, and the one or two developers that can't figure this out leave on their own. You don't even have to fire them because they get fed up with getting called at 3 a.m. And that actually did happen at Netflix. Um, <laughs> One of the, yeah, anyway. Um, but the site reliability team is still there, but instead of being the people who are firefighting and trying to fix everything that broke, their job is to build this tooling that attracts what is break, breaking and calls the right people to fix it. And then they also figure out how to measure whether there's a customer visible outage versus an internal outage. The customer visible ones, you want to create a trouble ticket, uh, uh, create a, a, an incident, and get people on a call and maybe call other people and you know if it's a really big outage you call marketing and PR and whatever. So there's, there's, there's an escalation process that they own the life cycle of the incident and they own the, the incident review at the end of it. We stopped calling them post-mortems at Netflix because that implies something died. Right? But incident and an incident review is a more neutral thing. We also stopped having war rooms, stopped having peace rooms. <laughs> just, a thing, just an idea. Because we expect nothing to go wrong when you know, House of Cards season two launches, but we're all going to sit in a room and like watch everything really carefully and have a peace room. And uh, you know, once it finished launches, they crack open the champagne or whatever. Um, but the other trick is that developers aren't the only people in the call team. How do you get developers on call? How do you do that? Well, you don't actually get developers on call. You do it top down. What you do is the VP engineering goes on call. And then all the managers under him are below him in the call tree and all the way down to the developers. And if you don't pick up that 3 a.m. call, then your manager gets the call. And if he doesn't pick it up, the director all the way up to VP. It's a really bad idea to have several layers of management fail to pick up an incident and wake up a VP. So it doesn't happen that often. Again, the incentives. This is a systems approach. It's, an, it's setting up the incentives and the feedback to cause people to have the right behaviors. Right? If you do nothing else but create a call tree like this, so that, you know, and literally it's top down, the VP has to say, I'm going to be on call. Your job is to make sure I never get called and work that out down the system. If this is the only change you make, it's a, it has an amazing effect on the, the productivity and the reliability, availability of your site. The other thing here is we've broken everything into very small things, very small chunks. So who here has a, a QA team that has ever said, uh, we need more time to test this release. Anyone ever heard that? So what do you, if you give them more time, okay, maybe that worked on that release. So maybe you had a four week release cycle and you gave them an extra two weeks. So what's, what happened th the next release? Well, they have six weeks worth of work in the next release instead of four. It's a 50% bigger release. And the, and the complexity and number of bugs in a release is not linear with the number of things. It's actually super linear. It's maybe, you know, it's some power law because the number of interactions went, got much bigger. So the six-week release actually take, is much harder to debug than a four-week release. So it turns out the thing you should do if people say, I need more time to do a release, is make them get that release out on the current time thing. But the next time around, release twice as often. Right? Give them half as much stuff and release twice as often. Right? Get to a two-week release cycle, get to a one-week release cycle. And what continuous delivery is really doing is it's changing one thing at a time. And if you're ever trying to debug what went wrong with something, like say your car's misfiring, like you don't pull out all the wires and then put them all back again under the engine bay. You like change, okay, is it this spark plug? Is it this spark plug? You do one thing at a time. It's a standard technique we all have learned to use in our lives for figuring out what actually is causing the problem, right? But when we build systems, it, because it used to be expensive and difficult to do a release, we threw 100 things into a melting pot, threw it over the wall, and then spent ages trying to figure out what interaction broke it. The, the, the difficulty of getting something into production with modern tooling is measured in seconds. Like if I have a Docker container and I could click a button, I could deploy that to production, get it up in seconds. But even the test environment, you could run tests on it in seconds. You might take minutes if you really had a complex test environment. That's 
So why would you spend, you know, do this once a month? Why do something, you know, why would you do something once a month that can be done in seconds? You should be doing it for every tiny thing you do. And each of those tiny things is very, very clear what broke and you can revert it easily. Like, okay, I rolled this thing, it broke, quick, go back, right? It's, it's, it's totally disambiguated all of the interactions, right? If this thing interacts with something else, you can tell exactly what those interactions are. So you gradually, you're, you're, you're taking this incredibly hard problem and you're breaking it to be an easier problem. So what it really comes down to is each time you manage to reduce the cost and the size and the risk of change, you've got a rate of change increase. So you end up with a much safer, more robust, more rugged system, and you're also going faster. Right. So that's, it's a little counterintuitive if people say, I need more time to give them stuff to do more, more often. Right. And this is basically what I was saying. It, it takes seconds to build something nowadays. Like if, it used to maybe if you've got 5 million lines of Java, it takes you a few hours. But nowadays, if you've got you know, 10,000 lines of Go, it takes a second. Um, it takes package dependent, packaging something into a container takes a few seconds, and deploying it takes a few seconds. So this is kind of where the world's going. This is one of the other reasons why Docker and containers are becoming a hot topic right now, because it's so fast. It runs at the speed you can think. Right? You don't even have time to go and get a cup of coffee while a build's happening anymore. So this fast tooling is, is critical, continuous delivery of many tiny changes. So this is disruptive. If you figure out how to do this, you're doing continuous delivery with containerized microservices, you can go so much faster than your competition, you're going to learn more, you're going to be more competitive. So that's the thesis. That's what's driving management. And that's why this kind of, these ideas are getting so much traction right now. Because people see that if they don't do it, they could be at a big disadvantage in the business. So if this sounds like I'm an alien from another planet and um, you, know, you need to kind of start from first principles somewhere, I'm going to recommend you start with Gene's book. Um, some of you, or some of you managers, might know about the goal from 1984. 30 years later, Gene and uh, his buddies wrote the Phoenix Project, which is a, a horror story about what it's like to be in a dysfunctional IT organization and with everything going wrong. And of course, it's got a happy ending. But you, but along the way, you learn all the principles of DevOps and a lot of useful things. But it's it's a novel. You can, you know, I think uh, Ross McClanton at, at Target bought 23 copies, gave, gave, gave them to all his management, gave them to all his team, made everyone read them, uh, play acted scenes from it on an offsite. Okay, you don't have to go that far probably, but that group at Target is, is absolutely leading uh, DevOps uh, group now. They have absolutely nailed it, so it's interesting. So what do I mean? I keep saying microservices. Let's try and define that. So my definition is a loosely coupled service-oriented architecture with bounded context. And a lot of SOA people will say, well, all of SOA was supposed to be loosely coupled with bounded context, except we ended up implementing it in SOAP and XML and a whole bunch of other junk. So if we throw away all of that old SOA stuff and we start again and say, let's have another pass at this, what we end up with is services that can be updated independently, meaning you know, if, you have, if, if everything is, has to be updated at the same time in the way you do your releases, you haven't got there yet. And bounded context is about how you divide up these services so they all have do different things. And Domain Driven Design by Eric Evans, a 10-year-old book that's part of the agile development sort of lexicon, that's, um, that's a key book for describing. The, back, the, the last third of that book describes how you take a big problem and break it into domains and how to figure out how to get those domains sized right. So what prevents you from doing this? And there's a bunch of things that couple applications. One of them is organizational coupling. If you're building something and you have to involve people from four or five teams to do it, you, you're going to end up really building four or five things. You're building something that's too hard to build. And you need to put, a, a team needs to own a service. Right? If, let's say you've got oversized teams. You've got a team in India or a team in China working on some. Give them their own entire microservices that they own from soup to nuts, from beginning to end. They deploy it. They have an API. And they own it and they run it. And their job is to conform to some SLA that you've agreed, some set of functionality. Don't try and build a, 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 you know, a globally distributed team working on one microservice. 
The next one is database schemas. There's a lot of the time everyone's talking to one MySQL and says, sorry, we have to do the alter table now, and they uh, bounce the database, and then we can upgrade all our microservices. That's another anti-pattern. That's probably the hardest one, because you have to break apart your databases. I mean, most companies have more than one database anyway, but once you've done microservices, you probably have about 10 times as many databases. And they'll all be like single function. They'll all, you won't be able to do joins anymore, because the things you're trying to join are in five different databases. Um, and basically, each database contains one schema, oh, sorry, one table or one materialized view. Uh, it's a very denormalized model, and it's actually, from a developer point of view, it's one of the hardest parts of the whole transition that, from what I've seen. And then you've got centralized message queues and you know, fixed protocol version. All these things tie things together. If you can't put multiple versions of messages into your system, then it, it gets too inflexible. So speeding things up. In the old days, we had these data center snowflakes, right? You launch it in your data center, it's at the same IP address for the next three years, and then you throw it away. That's kind of the old way we did hardware. Um, now, nowadays, you're virtualized. You know, we've moved on from server hugging to, to uh, VM hugging now, right? Um, we're deploying in minutes, and things maybe live for weeks, but they're moving around. And most of the monitoring tools can kind of, you can kind of convince yourself you could, you could keep Nagios up to date by deploying containers, right, by deploying VMs. But when you get to containers that deploy in seconds and maybe live for minutes, your entire QA environment may only exist for 30 seconds and then shut down again. Um, and that's a very valid way of using containers. In fact, it's a very powerful way of saving money and going quickly. Um, what does it mean? to even you know, have an IP address. Maybe they actually have an IP address, they have a port number, you have to kind of, the entity is a different entity. And then AWS came up with this thing called Lambda, which is a container that runs to service a single request and then goes away again. And you can see it on their, on their site. It's, you can build this system that's incredibly secure because you can't even break into it because the machines aren't even there unless they're servicing that one request and then they've gone away again. So the idea of compromising them is basically, you know, there's some, it, it doesn't make sense anymore. So they maximum three seconds lifetime. You get a million requests free on Lambda every month, every single month. And the next million costs you 20 cents. So it's not a very, you know, if you want to do stuff at home, this is a free way to build your own IoT you know, backend chaining system or something. I, I have to spend more time building my home system. But another problem here is like measuring CPU usage once a minute, like most monitoring tools do, just doesn't make any sense. And monitoring, contain, monitoring these microservices turns into being one of the biggest problems, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. So here's some inspiration, some books, um, domain-driven design, as I said, um, in search of certainty. Drift into failure is, is a, once you've built this incredibly resilient infrastructure, it doesn't break often enough for anyone to know what to do when it does break. So people, when it does, when something goes wrong, people generally just screw it up much worse. And Drift into Failure is a book about that. If you decide to read books on the flight on the way home, do not choose this book. A lot of its examples involve planes crashing. Uh, <laughs> after 20 years of maintenance, this failure has never happened. But the first time it happened, plane falls out the sky. Um, it's not, not happy. Um, lots of other good books there. I did a talk at DockerCon last year on the state of the art in web scale microservice architectures. Uh, if you're trying to get into microservices, um, go find that paper. I was trying to summarize all the different approaches. Are you, are you on cloud? Are you an infra on your own infrastructure? Are you doing uh, work in uh, Scala or Go or Ruby or Node or whatever, right? There's all these different languages and different environments, and there's a bunch of different a bunch of companies have figured out patterns based on which of those pa which of those combinations you want to do with. So let's think about scale. What does it mean to be large scale? Because when, every, when we, as we move to these microservices, we have more and more things to manage, and it's not just the number of machines; it's the hierarchy. Because now we have globally distributed systems. Like any anybody in their bedroom with an Amazon account or a, or a Google account can create globally distributed infrastructure now. It's trivial, right? Uh, and even the, you can create extremely complex networks now with, think, with the VPC. Um, it, it's amazing what you can do just, just with a credit card and, and a few hours to play around and learn this stuff. Um, so globally distributed, you've got lots of regions and zones. Maybe have hundred, uh, what, if you've been doing this for a while yet, with hundreds of different types of services, maybe there's thousands of deployed containers for each version if you're a large scale. Netflix is something like um, 30,000 instances, it's roughly that ballpark, you know, like 100,000 CPUs kind of size, which is not the biggest thing 
out there, but it's a pretty large, large environment. But it's trivial to build something with this complexity. And then you think, well, how am I, how's my traffic flowing through that? And you have to have tools that look like this. There are a few tools like AppDynamics that actually try and capture the flow as it goes through. New Relic have just launched this as well. So there's a few monitoring tools that are sort of APM space that can track the flow through your apps. Um, the Twitter have built a tool called Zipkin that can track flow, and Netflix has some tools they built as well. The trouble is, that's just a few microservices, and here's the actual architecture diagrams of a few interesting services. Um, you've know, got hundreds of things and pretty much everything's talking to everything else and you can't really make sense of it. And this has been bugging me for a while, so I've actually started trying to do something about it. Um, the other thing is failure modes. There's some interesting failure modes that actually you, you should be able to deal with. Things like, um, well, if you, this is a, 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 an environment that I simulated, and so I've got a load balancer, some API proxies, some business logic, a data access layer, and Cassandra in the back end. And this is kind of the Netflix canonical architecture. It's a simple architecture. So, and the reason it looks like there's three different legs on this jellyfish kind of shaped thing is that those are the three availability zones, three separate data centers that this is distributed over. And the typical way you run Cassandra is split across three data centers. And that's because it's a perfectly valid thing to get a network partition or a power outage. I call it you know, chaos, chaos um, backhoe, <laughs> right? Somebody goes, there's a backhoe digging up. So, sorry, took out your power cable and your network cable. Okay, so that's what that looks like. You just lost a third of your infrastructure. If this happens to Netflix, it keeps running. This architecture is designed to lose one third of its infrastructure and keep running. Now, almost every monitoring tool in the world would give you, you know, a hail of alerts and complaints and just drive you crazy, and it wouldn't actually be clear what's going on. Whereas the actual thing this should say is, everything's still working, st basically don't touch anything. You just lost all your redundancy. Don't screw anything up, but you're still running, right? So there's a challenge here, trying to understand these patterns. So how do we test this? So we've got monitoring tools where we can globally distribute an infrastructure. Well, you know, you can just deploy the stuff globally and then point your monitoring tools at it. Uh, and that's fine, it's just it gets expensive at, uh, after a while, right? You end up doing rather a lot of, of hardware infrastructure just for testing your monitoring tools. So I've been building simulation, and this is my, my simulation model um, that I just showed you. And it's an open source, I've written it in Go, and it's on GitHub, and I'm using D3 to visualize it. And you can generate one of these visualizations by defining your own architecture. And, and most recently, I've actually built a JSON object that defines it. So this is just the object. Um, there's a few things here, but each row here is a separate service. And that little diagram in the top right is generated by these, what, eight lines of, of, of object definition in, in JSON. And it's just got a name. The package is implemented in Go. It tells you the node count, so that's, you can see that in the diagram. Um, the regions you can scale up later, but you just set it up as one or zero to start with. Um, zero is for things that don't live in regions, like the DNS entry point that, that's sitting outside the regions. And then there's a, just a dependency list that hooks it all up. This, this is not, I'm not just visualizing this off this object. I'm actually running a real simulation. There's code running, there's lots of services, and there's traffic flowing between them. So what I'm going to be working on is to get this thing to generate actual traffic into real tools. That way I could simulate a real set of tools looking at, as if they were looking at a, a very complex set of infrastructure, network or systems or whatever. This is really a protocol simulation test suite. That's what I built it for. And I, it's, it's got out of control. I'm not, it's not my job to be writing code. I'm just writing it because it's in my head and it keeps trying to escape, so I'm writing code. Um, so I'm basically, it's called Simeon Viz is the other name for it because I'm simulating the Simeon army and I have a chaos monkey in there. Now this basically is working on something I call conference-driven development, which is when I go to a conference, I, I, that's my deadline for getting the next thing working. And OzCon at the end of July, I'm doing a workshop where we'll have people actually you know, writing code and building their simulations. And, and they've got a two-day workshop on microservices. So I'm going to be getting this in good shape for that. And then we'll have a room full of people actually developing it further. All right, so I'm just about done. So what's next? Well. This is, this is kind of 
what developers are going to have to worry about. Now, they're, if, if developers run what they wrote, that means they own the thing in production. They're not just responsible for putting it in production and making sure it doesn't break. They're also responsible now for the capacity planning and the efficiency of what they put and the cost of the thing they're running in production. So they start to see how much it costs to run their infrastructure. And that causes them to actually be, in fact, you have to be careful if you wave dollar signs at engineers. They usually overcompensate and they start getting too hung up on how much it's costing and quite often will build systems that fail more often because they're worried about what it's costing. So you have to be careful with this. But making it faster and cheaper is important. Lean is important. And then the other thing, they're also now responsible for the safety. They're responsible for the security and can their code be broken into. And you have to teach them how to do penetration tests as part of their development. You know, part of their build system runs penetration tests against their code. And they have to use keys properly and understand key management and where do you get these keys from and how do you, you don't just check keys into your code and into your container and ship them to production anymore. You've got to have proper key management and, and you've got to encrypt all your data at rest. And all these things have become developer concerns. So there's a conference in London in September that I'm leading which is specifically focused on agile, lean and rugged. Um, I've got Josh Corman leading the rugged bit. You may know him as a security specialist. Got uh, Nicole Forsman of Chef talking about lean, and um, Dan North talking about agile. And they're the, they're the leads for the three sections we're running. And I think something else that to think about, you're all networking people, um, is that developers in this new world, they actually they're trying to build higher level constructs, and what they really want is DNS. But what you're trying to give them is usually SDN. They got the letters the wrong way around, right? All the soft, software defined network to a developer is really DNS, right? They just, it's a hierarchy of names that they can just call, they stick it in a URL, and, and somehow their request gets to the other end. And I know there's all this stuff plumbing that has to happen underneath, but that is usually behind an API, it's in a cloud provider, it's in their open stack implementation or something like that. So I know you have to do the other bits, and there's some SDN happening underneath it, but as a developer concern, it's the other way around. And so this leads to another thing is I can build a global network without even knowing what MPLS stands for. You know, what I call this network function vaporization. One of the things Clouds is doing is taking all these network functions saying, I don't actually need any of them anymore. I can just make an HTTP request and it magically gets there. Netflix is running Cassandra clusters that are globally distributed effectively over the public network with just TLS protecting them. It's actually not technically routed publicly, but because of the way AWS regions are connected. But it's logically, that's the way it looks. Right? You don't have to go build all these complex things anymore. All right, just a couple more slides. Um, these are the, th if you do nothing else, you want to know more about microservices, get Sam Newman's book. If you want to know what's happening in enterprises as they're re-engineering, re Lean Enterprise is the book to look at. The Go language is becoming central to this. It's it, it, almost all the new things I see are written in Go. Uh, if, you don't, if you haven't looked at it, uh, take a look. It's very rapid development. It, it gets out of your way, and, and it's part of this whole agility. I have a whole bunch of uh, places I've done talks. I'll leave this up. I have time for questions, or I'm out. No, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, we've run out of quest run out time of for time. questions, but you will be standing on the side. So I'll be around for a bit. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, Adrian, th I'm sorry, go ahead. Do you have a last statement? No, that's fine. I just want to say there's some of the companies that I'm invest we're invested in, just to kind of let you know. Excellent. People Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.